Hi, I'm Jackson Bird, and today we're diving into the archives to talk about some of our transestors from throughout history. Originally, this series was just supposed to be one video, but I accidentally wrote way too much, so now it's two. If you're watching in real time, volume two will be released this coming Wednesday, so make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out. And if you are watching after October 2021, click on this card to watch the full playlist or use the link in the description box. And now, the introduction to this Trans Dudes From History series. Bear with me on this, because talking about trans history is complicated. So in the title, I used the word dude instead of men to be a bit more inclusive, even though a couple of the Wild West folks on the list were certainly not dudes in the old meaning of the word, like an inexperienced city dweller not used to tough life on a ranch. That's where dude ranch comes from. Anyways, I hesitate to say men because not all of the individuals I'm about to mention would have actually identified as trans men. In fact, I can guarantee that some of them did not use that term to describe themselves because the term trans men did not exist in their time. Transsexual wasn't coined until about the 1920s, and transgender not until the 60s, and both of them took several decades to settle on commonly accepted definitions. Transgender went through many different usages before coming close to how we currently use it in the 90s-ish. Language evolves a lot, and the language we have access to can necessarily change how we conceive of ourselves. For the trans people watching, I mean, think of how you thought about yourself before you learned the word transgender or non-binary. How did learning those words and the deep meaning behind them change how you thought about who you are? I, mean, I know for me, learning the word transgender and what it really meant opened doors of opportunity that I didn't think existed, let alone would ever open for me. You know, I went from thinking of myself as a young woman with a deep, dark secret I could never do anything about to someone who was probably a man and had a visible path I could take to living my life to my fullest potential. So when we look at people prior to the 20th century who displayed some hints of what we might today perceive as being trans, you have to remember that they didn't have the same language or resources that we have today. There was no hormone therapy or established paths of medical transition. And even without getting into class, race, and assigned gender limitations, there are probably a ton of people who felt the same way that many trans people do today, but who, kind of like I did, thought there was nothing they could do about it. So went on living as best as they could as their assigned gender, probably suffering in all kinds of ways, but, you know, therefore went unrecorded as gender transgressors in the history books. Now, of the people we do have records of, how can we be sure, given the language we use today, that they would say, yes, I'm trans? Well, I mean, we can't. But a number of historians over the years have developed various rubrics so that we can make some educated guesses, while attempting to respect and affirm the individual's legacy. Now, I tend to combine a few points laid out for consideration by anthropologist Jason Cromwell with some points made by historian Jenny Beeman. What I pay attention to, sticking to trans men for simplicity here, is did the individual indicate that they were a man? Did they attempt to modify their bodies to look more traditionally male? Did they try to keep their female assignment a secret? And did they continue to dress as men even after being found out, or if they weren't found out until after their death, did they live consistently as men throughout their lives? And as a bonus, there were also numerous people who died of curable illness or injury rather than reveal their sex assigned at birth which to me is a pretty big clue, but that's just my opinion. And one reason it's important to consider these factors when it comes to people assigned female at birth is that a lot of them, for many years, were celebrated as cis lesbians. Because queer cis women were kept down to the history books too. And a lot of lesbian and gay scholars starting in about the 1970s did amazing work to uncover a lot of these individuals. And without their scholarship, so many of these people's legacies would be lost forever. So even if it can be frustrating to see someone memorialized as cis when there's at least enough evidence to question that assumption, I'm still grateful that we have the records now at all. And I get it, when you find a person from history who might have shared your identity, it's exciting to get to add one to your numbers. And plus, some of these female assigned at birth folks who lived as men did have relationships with women, although not all of them. And maybe some of them dressed as men for love. I'm sure some did. But probably not all of them. 
and it can be tough to parse it all out without being able to hop in a DeLorean to go back in time and ask them. Additionally, for people assigned female at birth in particular, there's always the question of, were they living as men to access certain rights and privileges and job opportunities that they couldn't access as women? And there are definitely many, many instances of that happening throughout history. Cis women who maybe weren't even queer, who just wanted to access a better lot in life, at least for a time. Although, as Leslie Feinberg points out in Transgender Warriors, if passing from female to male is just an attempt to escape economic inequality, then why do we find transgender individuals, both female to male and male to female, among the ruling elite and the privileged leisure classes? So we can't say that everyone did it for better opportunities. There were plenty of people from wealthy families, not to mention actual royals, who cross-dressed or transgressed gender bounds throughout time. Feinberg points to Ashurbanipal of Assyria and Queen Christina of Sweden as just two examples. And hey, maybe some of them, like totally King Christina in my personal opinion, would say today that they're non-binary or agender or bigender or something like that. There's also the very real possibility that some of these individuals were intersex. We really don't know. But here are a few that historians feel pretty certain fell along the transmasculine spectrum, and a few more that were not only around once we had the language for them to assert themselves as trans men, but who also helped revolutionize the way us trans men today conceive of ourselves and what we're able to do within the legal, medical, and social bounds of our Western society today. Also, for the most part, I will be using he, him pronouns for these folks because that's what they predominantly used for themselves, and the people I'm about to talk about either went to their grave without ever revealing their assigned sex at birth, asserted multiple times that they were men, or at least lived happily as men long enough that I don't think he, him pronouns would offend them. And I also want to say that these people are pretty much all American or European because, in part, that is my own bias as an American, but also because Christian colonizers from Europe were the ones who usually pushed any non-binary, non-normative expressions of gender out of the societies they invaded. Whether it was in everyday identity or cross-dressing for certain cultural celebrations, subversions of the strict male and female was common in cultures around the world. And many of them had names for people who lived some or all of the time as a gender other than what they may have been assigned at birth or appeared physically to be. So I don't want to look to figures from other cultures and speculate that they might have been a trans man when they weren't, because their gender had a different name in their culture that meant something a little bit different. They might have been Two-Spirit or Mahu or Fa'atama. As Ricky Wilchins, founder of the activist group The Transsexual Menace, put it, it's not so much that there have always been transgender people, it's that there have always been cultures which imposed regimes of gender. How people have been allowed to express themselves and how they conceived of their own identities has changed throughout time and cultures, and been affected by each person's class, nationality, religion, and more. The one constant is that there have always been people who moved across the boundary between male and female, or lived beyond that boundary. They were there, even if a lot of our schools didn't teach us their names. And I cannot get enough of their stories, of digging through history, and finding people who are like me. So with all of that said, here are the first three individuals in this far from comprehensive series who pushed back against those regimes and who, regardless of how exactly they may have defined their gender to themselves, have inarguably played a significant role in transmasculine history. First, Antonio de Arauzo, sometimes also called Catalina de Arauzo, or Francisco Loyola, or Alonso Diaz Ramirez de Guzman, or the Lieutenant Nun. He went by many names, and he was a 17th century Spanish conquistador who escaped life in a convent as a teenager by dressing as a boy, and then gaining work as a servant and then a page, and later fled to South America, eventually becoming a soldier in the war against the Mapuche people, and upon returning to Spain after his birth assigned sex was found out, collected his adventures into a memoir, sometimes referred to as one of the earliest known autobiographies by a woman, even though in the original Spanish, De Arauzo almost always uses the masculine versions of words to describe himself. De Arauzo was an adventurous traveler, a brash fighter, a gambler, a soldier, a colonizer, and a murderer, not only of indigenous people in South America, but also of his own brother, granted on accident in a confused duel at night. De Arauzo became a legend in Spain for centuries afterwards, with countless books, plays, and films being made about him, often presenting him as a lesbian and sometimes heterosexualizing him as a cis woman unlucky in love with men. 
as is often the treatment of trans and queer historical figures, especially would-be transmasculine individuals. He certainly attempted to be read by the world as a man for most of his life, even apparently achieving a flat chest by way of what he told a writer friend was some kind of painful remedy, with the result being, according to the friend, very much to her liking. After his birth assigned sex was revealed, he was granted a military pension from the Spanish king and permission from the actual pope to continue dressing as a man. Allowances he was granted in part due to his class and the fact that he had killed on behalf of the colonial state. Details that can't be ignored when we look at who throughout history was allowed to express their gender authentically and who wasn't. And while there is some historical doubt around the authorship and authenticity of the memoir, which was not published until a century and a half later, there are enough historical records for us to piece together the existence of De Arauzo, including the celebrity that he gained once his identity was revealed, and his return to South America to live out a quiet life as a mule driver, dying as Antonio de Arauzo. Jumping ahead to the 19th century, during which we have an explosion of records of female assigned individuals who lived as men out on the American frontier. As historian Peter Bogue wrote, crossdressers were not simply ubiquitous, but were very much a part of daily life on the frontier and in the West. And he says crossdressers here, since that's pretty much what many of these people would have been viewed as doing at the time. But really, the American West in the 1800s was filled to bursting with queer people and all sorts of people transgressing gender in various ways, both loudly and quietly. The West was billed to non-indigenous people at the time as somewhere where you could go out and remake yourself, you know, escape from any problems you may have had back home, and in some cases, settle down in a rural area where you could be yourself without the constant surveillance of strangers in a city, which sounds pretty nice. One person who did just that was Charlie Parkhurst. Parkhurst was a stagecoach driver in California, a super tough and therefore incredibly revered, almost heroic kind of profession back then. Case in point, he was also known as One-Eyed Charlie, after a horse he was shooing kicked him in the face and he became vision impaired in his left eye. Charlie worked as a stagecoach driver for 30 years before retiring to open a saloon and work as a farmhand once steam engines started reducing the market for stagecoaches. And by all contemporary accounts, before his story became sensationalized and feminized, no one in his life ever really suspected him of having been assigned female at birth, or if they did, they didn't particularly care. When he passed away in December of 1879 at age 67 of tongue cancer, his neighbors came over to his cabin to prepare his body for burial, and at that point discovered his assigned sex. While this did end up leading to newspaper stories around the nation, at least initially most respected him as a man who had been one of the best stagecoach drivers around. His obituary, originally written by the San Francisco Call, was even republished by the New York Times shortly after his death in 1880. It is a glowing account of his life, super respectful, and even uses he, him pronouns up until the very end of it, which is particularly remarkable considering that the New York Times ran another obituary of him as part of their Overlooked series in 2018, a series in which they honor remarkable people from history whose deaths went unreported in the Times. I guess they forgot they had reported his death back then. And in the 2018 obituary, they use she, her pronouns the entire time without question. Like, New York Times, how did you do better at trans allyship in 1880 than in 2018? Jeez. But anyways, in contrast to the respect with which Charlie Parkhurst was treated, at least during his lifetime and immediately following his death, another dude out west around the same time did not have it as easy. Harry Allen, sometimes called Harry Livingston, was a bronco buster, a bartender, a barber, a ranch hand, a boxer, and a total heartbreaker. I mean, look at that face. Allen was born in Indiana in 1882 and allowed to dress as a boy from a young age, according to his mother, who would continue gendering him correctly and calling him Harry throughout his life. His family moved to Washington State when he was small, and by the time he was an older teenager, he was living in Tunnel City, a shantytown in Washington alleged by the press to be a wicked place of murderers fleeing justice, degraded women, and all sorts of the scum of the West stoking fear of the place in the same way the legend of Dodge City was painted by the press. Harry Allen, for his part, was in and out of jail his whole adult life, and lived much of his time under the microscope of the media. There are 
tons of newspaper articles about Allen, speculating on his refusal to dress as a woman and spreading fear about his alleged crimes. Allen was accused of all sorts of things, brawling, stealing, bootlegging, highway robbery. But how much of it was true is a little dubious. The newspapers might have exaggerated, but it also seems he might have been picked on and accused of more than he actually did due to his refusal to conform to gender norms. Sometimes he was arrested just because he was dressed as a man, being charged with the vague crime of vagrancy since there weren't yet laws on the books for wearing clothes of a different gender than your birth assignment. Although those would come soon. And whenever Alan did get arrested, he fought back, tackling the cops, punching them, even once biting one of them. In addition to his dressing as a man, he attracted the attention of police because he also dared to have relationships with women. Lots of women. The Washington Times even described him as clever in the art of lovemaking to women. So, go Harry. <laughs> Although, unfortunately, most of his relationships would end in tragedy. And some of those got even further hyperbolized and exploited by the media. There is so much more that could be said about Alan and about all of these people, and I hope to dive deeper on each in the future. But for now, I'll leave you with this quote from Alan in his own words from a 1912 interview. I always played with the boys and wanted to be one of them. I did not like to be a girl, did not feel like a girl, and never did look like a girl. I put on men's clothing and have not discarded them since. I will stop there for now. The next six trans dudes from history will be covered in the next video, so subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss when it goes live. Or if you are watching this in the future, click this card to go watch it now. I will be covering the first trans men to medically transition, a couple of awesome musicians, one of my personal idols, and a man that I like to call the trans Tony Stark. So look out for volume two, and also I know I haven't been making as many videos lately, and that is in part because I now host a daily podcast called The Kotki Ride Home. It's 15 minutes every weekday of me sharing cool and interesting things from current events, science, history, pop culture, and more. Sometimes I even sneak in a little trans content. So listen to that every weekday wherever you get your podcasts, and I will be back with a new video next week. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.